in a way, I'm a double alumna of LMH. I did my first degree here. I came back exactly 40 years later to take up a junior research fellowship. Um, and since 2018, it's been my workplace as well. And here we are, I hate to think of it, 50 years since I started um, as director of the Study Skills Centre. Um, there is a little piece in the news, which is just about to come out about the Study Skills Center, which I hope you will read. So today when you're asking questions, please do feel free to ask me about either thing. But my priority today is to talk about my other passion, which is history. My particular interest is in British medieval history. And as you will know, that period of history used to be known as the Dark Ages because we don't have very many written sources for it. Now in recent years, uh, what we know about it has been considerably boosted by some really amazing archaeological finds. Um, a key moment for me, for example, was the um, Watlington hoard of coins and silver from the age of King Alfred, which includes a couple of rare uh, two emperors coins. These show two kings, Alfred of Wessex and Kerlwolf, I don't, I've never been able to pronounce his name, of Mercia, seated side by side, um, that's on the right hand side, uh, below a winged victory of victory or maybe a uh, figure of victory or maybe an angel. This is an image which suggests an alliance between the kingdoms of Wessex and Mercia um, and it challenges all the things we hitherto knew in the written accounts which dismiss the Mercian king as a puppet of, of the Vikings. Needless to say the main source for that was the life of Alfred himself which he commissioned so you can probably imagine that perhaps it was a tiny bit biased um, anyway, um, interesting to say that uh, Shellwolf quietly disappeared from the historical record. We don't quite know how, but this has reopened debate about the relative power of Wessex and Mercia. There are other examples I'm sure that you're aware of, but sometimes the reverse is true. Archaeology can't always retrieve the early history of a place where the site's been rebuilt or developed in a way which removes the early evidence. And in those cases, perhaps there are some sources that we can look at, which are unexpected to help us. I'm currently writing a book for OUP in their medieval text series, and it's the life of a saint, Godric or Godrich of Finkel, who lived on the land still operate, still occupied by a later Benedictine priory. Now hagiography, that saint's lives has had a very bad press recently, um, or until fairly recently anyway, because often these texts are said not to contain very much of use to historians. In this case, however, um, the text of Godrich is full of information about his life, his surroundings, and all of that has long since disappeared. The Priory buildings are absolutely beautiful, and I do recommend a visit up you're up there. Um, they were in, built in stone and dedicated in 1196, when the first prior Thomas was appointed. Documents like wills, inventories, and account books from the 14th century right through to the dissolution give us quite a lot of information about that time. Um, and we've got a lot of descriptions of the history of the ruins since then. The site's been dug several times, but it's revealed only a few pieces of glass, stone, pottery, the sort of things that you expect from a functioning priory of 13th century onwards. Today, I want to take you further back in time uh, to when Godrich, its resident hermit and saint, lived on the site. We knew an awful lot about this chap because um, his life was written during his own lifetime by a monk called Reginald. Uh, Reginald was a Durham monk who was also a relative um, in some way of Godrich's and he was charged with his care for the last eight years of his life. Of Reginald himself, we don't know very much. We do know his Latin is really difficult to read um, and he has absolutely no regard for chronology, he doesn't cite his sources on the whole, and he drags as much into his story as he can from the Bible and the liturgy as he does from anyone else. But I find this absolutely fascinating because it seems to me not to offer only a glimpse of the life of a hermit in this place at that time, but the workings of Reginald's mind and his outlook as well. He sort of gives us the um, mundane and the miraculous all modeled in together. He assumes that his reader is going to be a medieval reader who will question everything. And so he tells us everything about politics, hand tools, travel, meditation, how things looked and what they meant. As is quite common with uh, this kind of text, there are very few dates attached to it. The only one we're certain of is uh, Godish's death date, which was the 21st of May, 1170. 
And that might explain why I've spent some time talking about him this year, because we've just passed his 850th anniversary. Later this year, we're going to hear an awful lot about the 850th anniversary of Thomas Beckett, who died in December of the same year. And in fact, a very good new exhibition of his life is going to open shortly at the British Museum in London. Now, according to Reginald, Beckett and Godrich never met, but they did correspond, they knew each other. And yet, while Thomas is extremely well known, almost no one's heard of Godrich. And yet the miracles attributed to, to Godrich is second only in size to the collection of miracles that we have for Beckett. Um, and so really it is quite an important document. So why do you think we've heard so little of the one and so much of the other? For the answer for Beckett is, is quite obvious, the politics of the time and so on. Um, but why given that we've lasted several hundred years without Godrich, do we bother with him now? Well, I suggest in part, it's to do with the way the history has been received. We've heard so little about him because at various points, right up actually to quite late in the 20th century, the story has been either suppressed or just disliked. His contemporaries disliked it because Reginald actually used the text to sling mud at some high ranking members of the church at the time. Um, the Reformation disliked it because they saw it as sort of popish superstition. The Victorians seemed to have disliked it because it was long winded and written in vulgar Latin, not the high classical that they liked. Um, the 20th century disliked it because it seemed to represent a largely local cult of appeal only to women, would you believe? And that was written in the 1970s when I thought we were a bit more enlightened. Um, and also because by then um, knowledge of uh, medieval Latin was not very widespread. And actually the language is really, really difficult sometimes to understand. Unpicking that history alone, the reception history would be an interesting exercise. But once you get into it, it's a mine of information which I hope will be of use to historians uh, of the 12th century for a long time after my edition and translation are, uh, are complete. I think some people have also been put off because it is a hagiography. If you read the first few pages, you might well put it aside as a bit of religious puff. Um, his early life owes much to the Bible. His parents were God-fearing. When he was born, would you believe his mother laid him in swaddling clothes because there was no room in an inn? Um, it's kind of familiar. Um, and his parents' friends celebrated in exactly the same terms used to describe the birth of John the Baptist. He was patient and innocent and learned the creed and the Lord's Prayer in the same sort of way that Jesus as a boy was very, uh, was very willing to uh, apply his, uh, his, his time and his effort to contemplation. And apparently he walked always in the paths of truth. But he was very unusual in many, many ways. First of all, he was the son of peasants, and many people who became saints were actually quite high born. He became a door to door peddler, the kind that you or I may turn away from our doors in the evenings. And then he became a merchant sailor, um, and he absolutely seems to have loved a bargain. Um, somebody actually in print compared him to Bill Gates for his love of buying and selling. I'm not quite sure that that's um, a particularly good analogy, but there we go. But what he did do was he soaked up stories of the people he knew. Um, that he was told about rather when he traveled, about holy men and hermits in particular. And so uh, he traveled to some of the pilgrim sites, such as Jerusalem um, and Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Some modern histories have linked him with a pirate named Godric, who rescued King Baldwin from Haifa in 1102 during the First Crusade. Colorful though that is, and it makes him sound, I think, a bit like a medieval Johnny Depp, I'm afraid there's no certainty that it was him. Um, the records are largely mute, but I think if we work on the text, we can see that he probably wasn't there at that time. And anyway, he went on foot, not by ship. When he came back, he did take a job for a while, but he still wasn't quite sure that's what he wanted to do. So he traveled a bit more. He went to Rome. He went to Saint-Gilles in France. Um, and then he came back home and decided to go back to Rome. But this time he took his mother with him. Um, they traveled there and back on that journey uh, in a group of other pilgrims but actually she must have been in late middle age at the time and made the, uh, the trip there um, very successfully and very happily apparently barefoot um, this is the kind of um, ship that they might have they might have traveled in to Jerusalem uh, but this shows how far Godric actually Godric actually traveled um, on his on his trips which I think is again not the sort of thing we expect of somebody who lived at the time 
It was when he came back that he decided that he actually wanted to be a holy man, a hermit, that he wanted to spend more time dedicated to God. He'd spent 16 years after all on the seas and was tired of doing that. So he sold everything and moved up to Carlisle um, where he had some relatives. They gave him a psalter um, and he treasured that and is said to have kept it always with him to such an extent that his little finger became permanently bent from holding it. But he didn't stay long there either um, and settled again in the countryside at Walsingham rather to the west of Durham and he met and lived with another elderly hermit there called Aylrich until Aylrich died 18 months later. I was very interested to see that their names are both posted on a gate at Walsingham. Uh, it has the names of Godrich, you can't see them very well here, but it does have the names there of Godrich and Aylrich on its gates. Now when Aylrich died, Godrich was very upset, but St Cuthbert came to him in a vision and told him to go to Jerusalem for a second time and then settle down as a hermit serving God close to Cuthbert, who would be his patron. That trip does seem for him to have been an emotional turning point uh, because he stayed there for some months traveling around and helping in the hospital, which I think means uh, quite a lot or gives us quite a lot of information about how he knew so much about curing and, and, and helping people later on when he was a hermit. He came back to England and looked for a place determined now to settle as a hermit. And Eskdale near Whitby was where he started out but the landowner didn't fancy having a hermit on his land, so threw him out and Godric came to Durham. Um, he was doorkeeper and bell ringer at St Giles's Church in Durham, which is still there. This is a, an early woodcut of it from the 19th century. And then at St Mary's School, he joined the young boys and learned psalms, hymns and prayers. So he took it very seriously. And then finally, he came to Finkel, which is about three miles outside of Durham, and settled there with the bishop of, uh, with the blessing of the bishop. After that, he's said to have stayed there for 60 years, leaving his hermitage on only three occasions to make short trips to Durham. Now that can't be quite right because St Giles Church was established, uh, we think, in 1112, but I think we can allow Reginald a bit of latitude on that one. We have a very long, long description of what he looked like. And interestingly, um, uh, one of the priests of St Godrich's Church in Durham managed to persuade the police forensic artist to do a photo fit and he must be the only saint to have a photo fit picture but this is it. Um, it seems to me to be a pretty good likeness. Um, it's certainly all we've got because the only other image we have is this sort of stock image from a, a much later manuscript. He's perhaps best known to people these days because he composed three of the earliest songs in English to have survived to the present day. And some of the later 12th century manuscripts, not the one I'm working on as it happens, have um, musical notation, which is really interesting. Um, his, uh, these, these have been um, reproduced, they've been copied, even Benjamin Britten had a go at making arrangements for them. So you will still be able to hear something like it on the, um, on a CD or online, um, but beware, I don't think that they sound in those recordings quite the way they would have done. He was ill, as I said earlier, for eight years and it was a very painful illness. And during that time, he talked a lot to Reginald and downloaded effectively his, his life history, which Reginald wrote down. So that's a great story. Uh, it makes him a very interesting character, but is there anything else behind it? Of course, if you think about a hermit, they rarely leave much behind them because they don't actually have very much. But I do think that we can rely on what Reginald says because um, he was the only one who was there at the time. He was there for a long time. He knew the old man intimately. He traveled there very often. He lived there and actually eventually he settled at Finkel after the saint died. So what can he tell us that helps us reinvent or, or retell the story of Finkel before the abbey was built? Well, it's a huge text, a text of over 140,000 words. So I could actually go on all day, but in honor of your um, brief lunch breaks, I'm gonna focus on just a very few, few things. Um, and I really would be very interested in any questions, reflections, ideas that you've got after I've spoken. 
So the first thing that struck me on, visit on, on visiting Finkel, which I did on foot from Durham along the footpath, which is, sorry, there we go. Um, now that's, you can see the sort of green arrowed mark there. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the green arrow mark in the middle of the screen is, is the footpath, which takes you up to Finkel, which you see in the top right there, where the Abbey is. Um, and the topography that Reginald described is eerily similar even today. It's, it's barely changed in places. Um, there is in the middle of it, you'll see the uh, Durham High Security Prison, which wasn't there in Godrich's day. That's right in the middle there, that big sort of square set of buildings. And the, the old footpath has to go round it. Um, but the Riverside Walk, the footpath rise, the fields fringed with trees on either side of the road, uh, they're very, very similar now to Reginald's description. And had it been possible, we had planned with the um, uh, Northumberland Archaeology Society actually to do that walk in conjunction with Reginald's text and, and, and um, look at it together in a group last year, but of course it didn't happen because of COVID. But I did it and following the text that I had with me, I found that I was actually getting goosebumps as I walked along because more and more and more of it was very, very immediate. Um, he of course encountered wolves just as he was going to the, the bit down the hill towards Finkel. Uh, he found a few wolves. Uh, we didn't, um, but we did end up being questioned by one of the guards on patrol at the prison who wondered what on earth we were doing wandering past the high security prison. Um, when we told him we were looking for fish ponds, he was a little bit um, nonplussed, but thought we must be um, harmless idiots and, and let us carry on. We did meet him on the way back and he asked if we would found them and we said, oh yes. So I'm quite convinced he thought we were harmless idiots. But having done that journey along there, we have in front of us then the site of the Abbey, which you saw earlier. And you might think then, straightforward, we know, we know where he was, we know where he settled. Uh, but actually, although the guidebooks, some of the guidebooks tell us that that's where he settled, um, there's been quite a lot of muddle over where actually he first set down his, um, his little hut. There is a hint of an early settlement about a mile away from the present site. And that site was dug by the um, then landowner, Mr. Smith, who's a farmer on the site, in the 1950s. And they did find some, um, some ruins. That original idea of a second site comes from a later manuscript. And that was written by another Durham monk called Geoffrey in about the 1190s, so quite close to the time. Um, now, he was a res really respected writer of Durham history, so we can't dismiss him, uh, but he didn't know Godrich or Finkel personally, as far as we know. But he tells us that Godrich settled on a plot of land at Finkel for a time, built a little house there, started to cultivate the land, but then found a more suitable spot and transferred to it. Later writers have picked this up, and many chronicles you'll see say that he did exactly that. He started in one place and moved to another. Um, some suggest that Godrich never lived at the current site of the Priory at all, which English Heritage would be very disappointed to hear. Um, but all I can do today is to present you with my dilemma and see what you think. If we look at a map, um, there is uh, more than one spot on the River Weir that can accord with the description Reginald gives us. Um, it's a spot on a riverbank. It has cliffs opposite and woods around it. And I think you can see uh, that's the, the little book in which the description comes. And here we have the two possibilities. I'm sorry the maps are so poor. I, I, I did actually pay for these to download them, but they're still not terrifically clear. Um, and there are two little places where it could be. The one on the right is where it actually is. And the one on the left shows that there is another possibility of a bend in the river, which, which also might work. Um, and... I'm not sure, I think the 1953 excavations were of the site a mile away from the Priory. So picking up on Geoffrey's story, there were now pre-existing ruins where Godric settled. We know that from Reginald and they've variously been said to be high status buildings, old houses. Um, and in one local poem, uh, which was actually reprinted in the Northern Echo, um, it's the place where St Giles used to live, apparently, um, and that's the poem which they which they um, which they printed. Um, 
I'm not quite sure why the devil will gulp the fat monks, but anyway, it's quite a nice little piece of poem, isn't it? Um, now we're told that the place where Godric started was overgrown um, and wild and impenetrable, and that there were lots of snakes there. And we're told that there next to the river Weir, he found a little grassy area of land, flat but small, surrounded by woods and by the river on all sides, except the south, with steep banks and huge cliffs opposite the river bank. There was also a hill on at least one side where he used to make offerings of gifts. I'll take you back to the maps for a moment. Um, and uh, people have tried to read into the place name something about where he may have been. Um, I like the one that says it was a bend in the river, that it's a Viking, just a Viking name for a finkel or an elbow. Uh, it might be a portion of flat land beneath higher ground by the side of a river, which I think the um, Anglo-Saxonists and maybe Anglo-Normanists might say was right. Uh, it might have been a place inhabited by birds, particular finches, and someone suggested that it might be the former palace of a king called Fink. So we're not entirely sure, um, but I think this actually uh, is a place where Reginald really seems to me to come into his own. Um, I think the site was probably fixed at the outset and I don't think it changed. Why do I think that? Well, the ruins found in the 1950s dig were stone ones. And of course, both the original texts tell us that Godrich built his first buildings in wood and turf um, and they haven't survived with only a chapel to St. John, which was built much, much later um, from stone still having um, any traces in the current site. Uh, when James Rain, a very famous uh, historian of Durham, was writing in 1837, um, he mentioned maybe the same site as this other site, saying that there were old walls clothed with turf and ivy. Um, and Reginald tells us that when Godrich arrived at Finkel, there were already old foundations. Um, but he also says that the river we are surrounded the plot on three sides with the southern approach uh, accessible. If you look on the right hand map, that seems to be correct. If you look at the left hand map, that seems that the northern uh, or northwest, uh, northwestern uh, was actually the one which was accessible. Um, and I also think that if you remember, I said he'd been thrown out at Eskdale near Whitby because he didn't get permission to settle and so the landowner harassed him. I think he would not have made the same mistake at Durham uh, because he did uh, take pains to get permission to live at Finkel. It, it was on his, his site here was on the Bishop's um, hunting ground. So again, fairly precious, but he did grant permission and sent a priest named Ralph and the Bishop's son also named Ralph to see that he found the spot and stayed on it. Um, I think given Bishop's reputations during those days, I'd be very surprised if they allowed a hermit to move house without a buy your leave. Um, I, I doubt very much whether they would have allowed that. But I do think actually that Reginald gives us a lot of description, which I can't go into here, which means I'm quite certain that despite all the stories to the contrary, the site where the Abbey now is, is exactly where it was. I think the final piece um, in the evidence that I've got is again, a documentary piece of evidence. And that's in a charter, which we know is um, not a forgery. Um, it's a charter from the bishop granting the hermitage after Godrich's death to two monks, Reginald and Henry, living at Finkel. Um, there's nothing to suggest the Fright Shrine was moved. There's nothing to suggest the body was translated to a new place. Um, and this all happened within the living memory of the bishop and monks. So I'm sure it would have been documented. There would have been a great big hoo-ha if the body had been translated or moved. Um, and so I think, uh, I think we would know about that. But I think again, um, Reginald gives us a hint about where the site was because um, one of the stories, of course, said to be a miracle, tells us of how Godric survived a flood. A storm devastated the area all around and at Finkel, he dashed the water against the rocks opposite the hermitage, but left him high and dry. And that seemed to be a miracle. Well, some years ago, we visited Durham just after there'd been a major flood of the Weir of a similar kind. And our hotel, the one we were in actually, and the office buildings next door were marooned and the huge tide had swept whole trees along the river. By the time we arrived, the water was receding a bit, but there were huge accumulations of branches and debris at the Weir in the middle of Durham. 
And in Finkel, the footbridge across the river, which usually stands high above the river, had lodged in it a huge tree trunk which had been swept and caught there. So it had been a really, really big flood. Um, but the Priory Bank was completely unscathed, apart from a bit of debris on the shoreline. Um, I don't think it was a miracle. I think it is that when that area floods, the water comes round like a centrifuge. Um, it surges around the corner, it mounts the cliff wall, it carries along with the bank, and the Priory site is left untouched. So again, um, and that didn't happen at the, uh, at the site a mile down. So I think I've, I've probably done that to death, but I, I really do think it's important for us to establish wh where this chap actually was for 60 years. Um, graves have been found in both places. Um, and a grave was found when digging at Finkel, which is this one. Uh, it's beautifully shaped stone coffin, and it is therefore very unlikely, despite um, English heritage's best efforts, to be the one in which Godrich was originally buried. Um, his bones may be moved, but as I said, there's no record of it. Um, he was actually interred in a hole in the ground, wrapped in um, a, a, a big cloth of uh, linen and wool, and there was a lead plaque put on it, and then that was encased in a, in a, in a wooden lid, um, and it was sealed with lead. None of these things survive on the site next to this. So I imagine that this is probably the site of a prior or a very important person. I've had great fun trying to untangle it. I hope that I've kept your interest in doing so, um, but um, I'd love to have your views about perhaps things that you think I may have missed. Wherever the site was, we do have lots and lots of information about the site itself. It was big enough and fertile enough to grow crops. There was soon a field for growing cereal, a vegetable garden and an orchard. And this tells us an awful lot about um, methods of agriculture and horticulture at the time, which are invaluable, I think, to those people interested in it. He was actually grafting apple trees using cuttings, which he was given, which is tremendous. The first building was a wooden, hook, wooden, wooden hut roofed with turf, living turf. Um, it's not described in detail, unfortunately, but um, the house was at the west end of the site. There was a chapel, a space between them, a tool shed, a millstone, a cupboard to keep his food in, a little oratory for his private prayers, and then much later the stone church that I mentioned earlier, uh, which was built using stone that was actually brought down in one of the storms that, um, of the kind that I've just mentioned. The foundations of that building, the, the chapel to St John, um, were found in 1927 within the existing church and that was then expanded and that's the only bit we have left of it. The um, little cottage, little hut if you like, was woven from hazel twigs. It had roof tiles above it, it was covered with cheap hay or straw and then plastered with mud. And here's an example from the Weald and Downland Museum of the kind of thing that we're talking about if you haven't seen them. Reginald says inside it was securely enclosed with pointed weaving materials uh, from twigs woven with mud or straw. And it was, and he describes the, um, the way it was sited. Um, it's that bit, unfortunately, is in the kind of Latin which actually you need a, you know, a, a cold towel for when you're actually reading it. It's quite difficult to work out what it was. Um, but um, we do know that uh, it was built of wood with large rafters, uh, that it was joined to the oratory, that it was personal use for food and for guests. On the south side of it was another one which is said to be for necessary use and which later apparently caused a stink which made St John come down and tell them to move it. Um, but um, so that was there as well. Um, and these were all very close to the other buildings. Now what I did, that's a, a sort of size, style of thing that you can have. I did a little drawing of what I thought the layout was and I think that's pretty much it. So as you see we have the oratory, um, we have his little cell. So the oratory was for private prayer and he did have guests in there. The little cell was where he, he ate his food and dealt with his servants because believe it or not he had some. Uh, that big chapel of St John's is the one which we know the dimensions of because they were measured when the dig was done in the 20s. Um, and his little chapel of St Mary's was at a distance and eventually he roofed it over and put a cloister there 
his tool shed was to the north and the toilets were to the south. Um, and it's interesting that they did actually, they did actually move the loos. Um, so um, presumably a little bit further away, maybe closer to the river, which is um, to the south of this. The other thing that I found really interesting that again, there is absolutely no record of uh, from the archeology, span from the digging is about tools and furniture. And again, that might be of interest to some of you. They were mostly agricultural tools, of course, um, or furnishings for his chapels, and he acquired them bit by bit. At the start, the only thing he had was a homemade spade and a mattock. And here you've got um, a picture of a mattock and an axe in uh, another, another psalter that's on, on the left-hand side. Um, and there's a mattock also on the right-hand side. Um, I imagine Godrich's were very similar to this. We were just a wooden handle and, and, and uh, some kind of metal, perhaps metal at the end, maybe not even that, maybe a sharp stone at the end. Um, he certainly used sharp stones for cutting plants, um, or he had a piece of wood which he'd made himself into a sort of tool. And then he acquired a double-edged axe, which would be even more handy than the one you've got there, um, which was for, um, I don't know what exactly, I mean, we're not told what he used it for, but we know he had this double-sided double, double -sided axe. And only very much later was he um, well enough known and trusted to be able to borrow a set of oxen and a plow for his fields. So in the meantime, apparently he actually um, dug up his fields with his hands and feet, which is quite interesting. Um, his house had a stone, stab for, uh, stone slab sorry, for a table. Um, and soon he did have a servant help him. First of all, it was his brother's son who came along to help. And then later on, we, seen, we, we see evidence of more servants, but we don't actually know who they were or how many they were. Um, but the servant was never able to enter the oratory, which again is in, in the drawing there. Um, and because it was very, um, because it was uh, the practice, if you like, for him to pray in peace and silence in the river, he used to dunk himself in the river in the cold, basically, and um, spend all night there in prayer. Um, but when there were more people around the place, he couldn't do that in peace and quiet. And so he actually bought a, a very large barrel, which he sunk into the ground in the oratory and he used it as a cold tub, just filled it with cold water, covered it over so nobody could see it and use that for his prayers. So we know again that he, he had access to quite large things. How he got them there, I guess, again, we're not told these things seem to have appeared by magic, uh, but I imagine there was quite a good, um, a, a good route for horses and carts and things between Durham and Finkel once, once he was established and people started to come. The chapel itself, um, its furnishings were, um, sorry, those, those are some of the tools that we saw at the Neuchâtel Museum one winter. And I think this is very, very similar to the kind of thing that we're thinking, thinking he would have had. Um, this was a wonderful stop. It was meant, meant to be a lunch stop, and we happened to find that there was a museum there. And this is the best place I have found for uh, a collection of, of wonderful tools. And so there you see the double uh, headed ax, you see some other axes and small cutting tools and things, which they think they've securely dated to the 12th and 13th centuries. So they're pretty much the right kind of, right kind of age. Um, other items that are similar to the ones he had, he had a little jug um, for his uh, water. He had a, a wine horn, which you see in the middle there, and he had um, a, a wooden pyx. Now, this is very much more fancy than the one he would have had uh, for keeping the host. But um, those three things he had, and those were said to be the very basics that you could have in a chapel if you were going to um, to have performed for you, because of course Roderick couldn't do it for himself, um, the basic rites of uh, the Christian church. It had a little altar, which we don't know very much about, but it did have a crucifix on a shelf. And as far as we know, that was quite a fancy one. And the story is told that on one occasion, an artisan who was at the fair of St Cuthbert in Durham came along to him in despair because he said, I, you know, I, was, I brought all this stuff along here. 
Um, I've set out my store, nobody's buying anything. Um, and Godrich told him, don't you worry, you, you just go back. I'm sure that by the end of the day, it will have been fine. Um, and of course he sold everything, which again is another apparent miracle. Um, and the craftsman was so delighted, he rushed back um, and he gave Godrich a crucifix, which he'd fashioned. So I imagine that's possibly where the crucifix came from. We don't know uh, whether he had anything sooner than that. Um, we think that maybe he held gold for local wealthy people. Um, I wonder whether he was the original Northern Rock in that sense, keeping people's savings, but um, robbers came and certainly robbed him of it. And we know it was his habit to keep precious things in, his, in holes in the walls in his building because he kept salt there as well. So that's quite interesting insight that I didn't know before, but maybe you do, what things people squirreled away in the walls of their, um, their buildings. Um, he had a cow for milk later on, uh, that was a gift. Um, the fishing is really interesting. He's very, very famous for his salmon and his singing. And uh, there's a wonderful description of the kind of fish traps that he created for himself. It's a long, thin baskets woven with twigs which apparently were very successful at catching the salmon as they came up the weir. Um, so again, you know, we can look at similar items, but it's very, very interesting that at that time, this was a recognized method of fishing and we have this on record here. And he had a vegetable garden, we know that, though what he grew there, we don't know. All we know is that the local rabbits loved them um, and he had to do something about that. We do know he had a drinking cup and that later became one of the relics um, that was held at Durham uh, because it was called for and it was going to be used in a cure of one of the local noblemen whose throat closed up so that he couldn't eat or talk for 10 days. And he was cured, of course, by drinking water from it. So I think that little group of possessions tells us quite a lot about the kind of things that people had at their disposal. Uh, relatively poor people, but the kind of things that a, a base, a layman in effect would find absolutely necessary if they were going to have rites performed for them um, according to the Christian uh, religion. There are quite a few relics which um, again give us an insight because many of them are very mundane things that he, he, he owned. The cult ha was said, has been said, to have been very local, and I, I think that's very wrong now. Um, but it has largely been dismissed for centuries for that very reason. Um, but there's evidence from cathedral relic lists that he was really well known and revered. So that tells us something interesting, I think, about how news about people traveled um, and how there were these lines of communication between churches, between Christians, which I think we knew existed, but this is just one more piece of evidence for that. I think it's surprising that there are very few primary relics, certainly no bones and no teeth, but there is hair from his beard and from his head. We have a very late inventory from Finkel in 1481 that says there was a psalter covered in silver and silver gilt, a girdle of hair cloth, an ivory comb, a portion of a woolen shirt, um, a cowl of old Faustian, a part of his vest, um, not quite sure what cloth that would have been. If somebody is out there who knows about clothing, please tell me. Uh, a portion of his boot, which must be fictitious because he actually is said to have gone barefoot for the rest of his life after Jerusalem. Um, and some old white hairs, which, you know, he had a plenty apparently. Durham had several bits of his beard and his chainmail tunic. He was one of the few um, uh, hermits who wore chainmail as, as an act of penance. Um, they had a piece of his inner garment, which may be the same as the vest. Uh, they had a tunic, a belt, and bits and pieces of, the, uh, of, of his uh, clothing. But they also had some pieces of St. Godrich's bread, which is interesting because he used to send bits of bread to people. Um, as far apart as uh, the south of Scotland and down to the south of England, uh, if they were asking for a cure. 
So the commonest things we have tend to be clothes. It, I, I think because of that, we can possibly guess that those people who collected these things uh, collected them from a very poor set of resources. There was no gold or silver or precious relics there. But what is very interesting is that very soon after his death, there were relics of his at Litchfield, at Moe near Hull, at Waltham, at St Albans, and at Salisbury. Um, and a little girl at Kelso in the south of Scotland was reported cured by drinking some water in which a piece of his chainmail tunic had been soaked. So these spread far and wide very, very quickly. Um, and I think with so much evidence for him, I've sort of answered the question I asked at the beginning is why are we interested in this chap? It is of course, because we have all this information and I hope I've shown, shown that we can actually uh, dig up some archeology span from documents which are um, in many cases as wealthy and as rich as this. Um, but at the time, I think he was quite well known and revered and that may make it even more surprising that so little has subsequently been written about him. As I said earlier, I'm hoping that that will change in the near future when the um, text which I'm translating is published later in the year. Um, and I've also spent some time working on the songs, although I'm not a, I, I'm not a, um, a musicologist, I'm not an expert in music, um, but they've had a completely separate transmission from all the other aspects of the life. Um, and I've been looking at those with a view to reassessing those as well, because I think that what we have doesn't necessarily give us the full picture of the kind of music that he was singing and, and performing. So I think to sum up, um, if anybody asks me who I would like on my historic dinner guest list, um, Godric would be up there, I think, with them. Um, but I think also, despite his very poor reputation as a turgid writer, um, I wouldn't mind meeting Reginald. He'd certainly be a wordy guest, I think. But I think that what he does in this text is tell us as much as he was able to know, he assumed we'd be as interested as, as he was, um, that he gives us a vision of the entirety of the world that he knew or knew of. And he allows us to look through the gaps that we have in our knowledge to see what we can dredge out and perhaps understand a little bit more. But what he also did, I think, when I was working on this, is tell us that. Uh, our world is still, I think, strange and uh, unfortunately, I don't know as much as I thought I did or would like to think that I do, but it's been a fascinating journey and I'll be interested in your comments and queries and questions and I do hope that you found what I've had to say interesting. I apologise that it's been so rushed, but I did say I would stop in time for questions. As I said earlier, I could go on forever because this text is both wonderful and extremely lengthy. <laughs>